I'm back with another match chat. This week I spoke to Leon Haslam, who's a really good friend. His mum, Anne and Ron, helped me a lot when I was younger at the Ron Haslam Race School. So I spent a lot of fun days with him. I've also done a few bonfire nights at his, which is the most lethal experience of your life. So at some point in the video, I'll put the bonfire night experience. And yeah, just had a quick catch up on his racing at the start of this year because he was quite lucky that they managed to get a race in. So I hope you enjoy the video. Hey, up, mate. How's it? Not bad. How are you? I'm coffee. <laughs> are you sponsored by Starbucks? I should be if I must have spoken. <laughs> You've obviously ridden a lot of bikes during your career. As long as I can remember, I can remember you racing. I think one of my earliest memories is you, um, when you were 14, were you 14, racing the scooter championship? Yeah, yeah, 13, 14. Yeah. So uh, I always hear my dad talking about 500s and how they were unridable and the most hideous things, but you were probably one of the youngest people to ride one. How old were you and what was that like? Yeah, um, it was an experience, you know, I'd... Um... I jumped from a scooter to a 125. I had two years on a 125, and then I was in MotoGP on a 125. So at 16 years age, I was kind of living on my own in Bologna on a 125. And then at 17 stroke 18, I jumped onto a big two stroke 500 before. Um, you know, I actually started off that year on a V twin, which was probably a little bit easier. It was a bit more like a big 250. Um, but then halfway through the year, um, when Chris obviously left, I, I got the upgrade up to the V4. Um, as soon as I made that jump to the V4, I crashed twice every weekend. Uh, big, big high sides. You know, no electronics back then. Um, you know, a power band in the space of a thousand RPM. And uh, yeah, I had some massive, massive crashes. Um, I broke my wrist, my collarbone. Pre-season testing, I think I crashed at every single test we was at. And, you know, I was 18, I was loving it, I thought it was amazing, I was on track with Rossi and Roberts and, and all the boys, but um, yeah, big, 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 big learning curve, I can say that. Yeah. What was your, you must have had quite a few injuries in your career, what's your worst injury been? Um, probably my 2013 leg break at Aston on the 10k Honda. Um, I got my leg caught in the back wheel as I high side and went into the gravel, um, yeah, typical fashion. I, I raced three weeks later at Donington. Um, but yeah, I had a, a pin, some screw. Now the bone itself wasn't that bad, but it was all the ligament dip damage and, and obviously all the soft tissue damage that, you know, realistically, I'm still struggling with now, you know, and that was seven years ago. Um, it's probably one of my long lasting injuries that, you know, for a good year and a half on that 10K bike, you know, I did Suzuki Eight Hour that year, um, two months after I broke my leg. and. I remember walking to the bike on crutches and, and we won to do a great hour that year on crutches. But, you know, in hindsight, I probably just should have sat out and recovered properly. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, from a long-lasting injury, probably that's one of my, my worst I've had. You are the king of riding whilst you're injured as well, so I don't think that helps. Um, yeah, you know what's really strange? This lockdown, um, like, my whole career, 20-plus years, you get, like, a three-week period, you know, after the testing's done, you get three weeks off at Christmas and then you're back in again. And with this whole lockdown, it's the fittest I've ever been. It's like the fightest I've been. I'm, I'm, it's the first winter I've not had an operation. I'm, I'm like, I feel, feel revitalised as such, you know, with this whole lockdown. But uh, yeah, you know, it is part of the game. And um, yeah, I've definitely had my first share of injuries. Yeah. Um, so out of all the bikes you've raced over the years, what's been your favourite one to race? Um, I really enjoyed the 2010 year on the Suzuki um, purely because I, I, I was arriving from a very private Honda um, the Suzuki was at a very similar level to the Honda in that year but then the expectations that year was, wasn't that high you know they, they'd only had 5-6 in the championship the year before and for me it was quite a good step up in, in the level of the team the bike was so balanced you know from the very first test to the last race we never really changed the setup and it was always competitive, you know, we finished second in the world that year and we gave the Aprilia a run for its money and, you know, we beat the likes of Factory Yamaha, Factory Ducati, which fundamentally was a private Suzuki. So I think they all low expectations, but a bike that was so planted and good and it was a bike that kind of suited my style where you could just ride it as hard as you can. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of really suited me. Um, so, yeah, that year I have a lot of good memories, obviously, you know, my first win and, and obviously challenging for a world title was, was obviously a really good highlight. 
Um, but then I've also, like, this year, you know, starting off a new project with a Honda, um, having the might of HRC behind you, that alone has been super exciting. Um, this whole not riding the last few months has been, you know, kind of put a bit of a damper to it because I feel that, you know, we have such momentum with the bike, a lot of potential is there, you know, such an enthusiastic team. And, uh, yeah, fingers crossed we can get back on that train again. But, uh, yeah, you know, for me, this has also been an exciting start with a new project. Because straight away you were competitive, really. What was that bike like compared to last year on the Kawasaki? The thing is with the Kawasaki is that, you know, Johnny had just won five world titles on that exact bike. So there was no question the bike and the team was capable. Um, but also that kind of fixated in them in a way that it had to be ridden that way to win. And yeah. Me being me, I just totally tried to adapt my style, do what Johnny was doing. And if I had two, three days testing, I'd get where he was at. But when I was rocking up at races that I'd not been to for three years because I've been in England and I'd had two 45-minute sessions to not only learn the track, get up to speed and adapt my style to somebody else's to yeah. ride that bike I was ridden, that's where I come on still. Um, certain tracks suited my natural way and we had some good races. You know, we, we battled with Johnny till the end. But, you know, honestly, it was a tough year. Um, I knew what I needed to do. I needed to change, but it was a tall order for year one and my typical fashion, I obviously, when I wasn't, quite there i overrode it and jumped off it a few times as well yeah so, uh, yeah it was one of those tough years and i think it was always going to be tough going into that role i would say especially from where i'd come from from england and and whatever else um but with this honda thing it's, it was kind of the f reverse of that you know um from the very first test to the first race it was a matter of a month and a half and it completely listened transformed the bike to me and you know we was competitive you know we, we knocked seconds off of lap times and you know, race one in Phillip Island, we were battling for the podium with two laps to go. So for the first rollout of a new concept and in such a short period of time, it was obviously I wanted more. You know, we had a few issues that weekend that, you know, I was kind of kicking off with about. But at the same time, if them issues wasn't there, we, we would have been very, very close. Yeah, that's good. Um, and then I think the, the one side of you that some people wouldn't know is that I've got to know is the farm that you live at and how mental it is at the farm. So I've managed to dig out an old video of our bonfire night experience. Um, but first, before I get to that, the, when I first got there, the, my initial introduction was the battery game. Sorry to interrupt. I've realized I didn't explain what the battery game is. It's basically four pieces of wire that people hold that Ron then connects to a battery and one person at random gets electrocuted. But that quickly spiraled out of control to who can withstand the most electricity going through their body. So we just carried on connecting batteries till someone gave up. Game. Yeah. What, who creates all these games and where do they come from? Where do you get the ideas for them? And what's the worst it's, one out of them all? It's all my dad. It's definitely all my dad's fault. I'm blaming him. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've grown up with it. You know, even in my teenage years, I'd be coming home late and, you know, my dad would be hiding in my room underneath the covers and just, I don't know how long he's been waiting there for <laughs> from the night out. But yeah, it was just, it's one thing after another, you know, the electric fences, um, all sorts, you know, handing me something that had just been welding, so it was really hot. It was, I think it's just the banter of the farm. And, you know, I've been quite lucky that I've grown up with that. You know, we had always racers living with us, James Hayden, Nick Hopkins, uh, Carl Harris. We've had so many people over the years living there, mechanics living with us uh, from running race teams, whatever. And, you know, every day is a, a school day, as so say, you know what I mean? It was always playing and who could jump the furthest and you know this lockdown's been fantastic because you know we have had the farm um me and my dad's just been playing barren hours and you know trials riding and whatever it may be so uh, for me it's just been uh you know awesome and and obviously we've managed to you know get a few of you boys involved as well so uh yeah it, it has been fun over the years for sure and how when i turned up there one day and suddenly it was just a phone pit out of nowhere how did you make the phone pit in the ramp you know you know what was really strange with that and it was straight after I broke my leg really bad. And, um, you know, in season, I try and stay off motocross bikes. I try and be, like, a little bit cautious in, in the things that I do in season. And I broke my leg, and I had this really good idea that a foam pit, and I wanted to do a backflip. So, yeah, off the back of breaking my leg, I decided to do, like, probably the most dangerous thing ever and, and build myself a foam pit. And, uh, yeah, obviously, you was there. You was the one that kind of tested it out with me, and I think we had eight hours straight trying to do a 360. And, yeah. Know, 
yeah, you know, it's just one of those things. It's foam pits one year. We had mini bikes another year. We um, we got massive into trials one year. Um, you know, we've been lucky enough to do a lot of flying. So me and my dad's been fighting about in planes for the last few months as well. So uh, yeah, there's always, there's always something happening, and uh, yeah, it's been fun. Can you fly as well, or is it just your dad that can fly? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've had a license for a few years now, and uh, yeah, he, he's really enthusiastic with it. Um, I kind of just use it to get places, you know. Where, <laughs> you know, I've managed to fly to a few BSBs, which was nice. We landed at Snetterton on the back straight, and I think my dad landed at Cadwell from down the back straight as well. This which is cool. But um, yeah, no, the, the flying thing is really good, and um, I'm, I'm lucky enough, to obviously, living on the farm with my dad and. It's kind of like a best friend situation as far as, you know, we passed the diving courses together, we did us flying exams together, we go trials riding together and we've been pit biking at least once a week these last few weeks together and uh, yeah, it, it's been pretty cool. And he's not showing any signs of slowing down. How old's your dad now? Has, yeah, 63 now with dad. is. um Yeah, I think he can feel big days out now, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we've had a, a few um, big trial days or whatever it may be, and um, he definitely suffers the day after. But, yeah, it, it doesn't stop him, which is fantastic. Um, you know, I love getting out on the race school with him, um, just playing, on, even if it's on little one, two, five, four strokes, whatever it may be. And, uh, you know, for us, racing has been, you know, part of my life from, from zero, and it has to be fun. And, um, you know, the, the racing side of it can get a bit serious sometimes and get on top of you, get stressful. But, you know, a few days on the farm, playing on whatever it may be, um, you know, kind of brings you back down again. Yeah, wicked. Well, and the bonfire thing, I'll put the video in the middle of this, but that was basically just... Uh, I've never been to war, but I'd imagine it feels similar. <laughs> and what, the best bit of the video I like is that we were hiding behind a gas tank that we didn't know in the pitch black. That was... Uh, I remember that. And yeah. I had, like, a Bunsen burner as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, honestly, I think that was the last bonfire night we had. Um, my mum's banned bonfire night. Ah, she? About, yeah, but, uh, yeah, I think we need to revitalise a, a new one this year. Let's back up again. Yeah, wicked. All right, thanks very much, Leon. I'll speak to you soon. All right, cheers. Bye-bye. Hold this, hold this, hold this. That's another Mac chat done. If you enjoyed that, please subscribe to the channel and give the video a like. I'll be back very soon with another one. Bye for now.